All right, we're going to get started, I think, on the uh, market transparency panel. Uh, and uh, there may be other people that drift in, but the ice cream is a, a big attraction, so I'm not taking this too personally. Anyway, my name is Mark Toby. I am uh, the uh, special counsel for agriculture and state relations at the U.S. Justice Department Antitrust Division. And uh, this panel is on market transparency. Uh, we heard a lot about this subject this morning. We're going to talk about the CME. So uh, we have a, a very distinguished panel of uh, experts and people that know about the market by participating in it. And uh, I want to start off uh, maybe by uh, introducing each one a little bit and then making some introductory comments uh, to put this topic into some context because the issue of price discovery and market transparency is an issue that is not unique to milk or to dairy. Uh, and I want to talk about it a little bit in, uh, and I think you know one or another of our panelists will also likely talk about it a little bit in terms of how the, this issue manifests itself in other industries so that we can compare it or other parts of uh, agriculture. But on our panel today, and we'll, we'll sort of work from my immediate left uh, to the end, uh, we have a, a very distinguished group. First, we have uh, Tanya Rushing who is a third-generation dairy farmer from uh, Walthall, Mississippi, which is the, uh, the, the, the uh, cream, the cream, pitcher of, cream pitcher of Mississippi. And she'll talk a little bit about her farming operation and her uh, views on, uh, on this issue, which is you know, subject to a lot of experts talking about it, but also, as we heard this morning, has a lot of effects on you know, average dairy farmers, even small dairy farmers. Next, we have um, Bob Yonkers, who is the Vice President and Chief Economist of the International Dairy Foods Association, where he oversees research and analysis about the uh, economic impact of marketing conditions, government regulations, and uh, alternative policies on both U.S. and international dairy industries. Uh, next to him is uh, Andy Pauline, who is an assistant director with the U.S. Government Accountability Office, the GAO. He's based in Chicago. The GAO, as you probably know, is a legislative agency that assists Congress in carrying out its legislative and oversight responsibilities. Next, we have Dennis Wolf. Well, actually, the, the order is flipped here. Uh, Dennis Wolf is next to the end there. Uh, and uh, he is the former Agriculture Secretary uh, for the state of Pennsylvania, uh, and he is currently a partner at Versant Strategies, where he represents uh, a group called the Dairy Policy Action Coalition. Next to him, on his right, uh, we have Steve Obi. Steve is the Acting Director of the Division of Enforcement of the U.S. Commodity Future Trading Commission, the CFTC, as we've heard described this morning. And this is the second time that we've been uh, graced to have Steve's presence uh, on a panel. Uh, and uh, he'll talk about the CFTC's activities and doing oversight of these uh, uh, dairy markets, um, including the CME. And uh, last, but certainly not least, is uh, is uh, Dan Smith, who you may recognize. Yes, it's the same Dan Smith from the last panel. But uh, he is uh, representing a little different role for this panel. Uh, he, on, in this panel, he is talk, going to talk about some work that he's doing on behalf of the Maine Dairy Industry Association. So thanks to all of our panelists for being here. Let me make my introductory comments, which I hope will help to put this topic in a little bit of context. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, the, um, what we're trying to do here. We're, we're not trying to make a point. We're trying to explore the, 
the concerns that we heard about this morning about the ability of certain dairy industry participants, particularly producers, or the need of those people to get accurate, up-to-date, i.e. timely and relevant information about prices. And I think that's what the concerns are about potential manipulation of price. And we'll explore what the concerns have been about uh, how elements of the milk price might be manipulated or subject to strategic trading, uh, particularly on the CME. The bigger picture is that agriculture markets of, of all different types tend to use a reference price, and here we're talking maybe the cheese uh, price, the spot cheese price as a reference price in dairy, but it's also true, we heard from some hog farmers this morning, in hogs, there's a formula price that's used, and in that, in that, in those kinds of contracts where hogs are so, sold based on a formula contract, there's usually a reference price, and that might be, say, the Western Corn Belt uh, price, and that price is actually uh, reported twice a day by the USDA. So that's that's the way price transparency happens in hogs. In grains, uh, we talked about grains at the Iowa workshop that we did, which was our first one, and uh, their grain futures. There were concerns expressed about potential speculation or manipulation of grain futures. Uh, our last workshop that we did, we talked about poultry. And in poultry, there was very little need for a discussion about price discovery, because as we've heard and it's been discussed, and you all probably know, the poultry industry is largely or completely vertically integrated. So um, there, there is basically no open market for the sale of broilers. And uh, so there, the, the issue of price discovery is, is not as significant there. In the next workshop that we're going to do, which will be at the end of August in Fort Collins, Colorado, we're going to talk about livestock. And in those areas, too, the issue of price transparency and price discovery are important because a lot of cattle are sold by formulas or, or sold what, on what's called the grid. So these concerns about market transparency and price discovery are real and they permeate all kinds of agriculture markets. Now, in dairy, the linkage is a little more direct because this reference price not only is important for contracts between people that manufacture or sell cheese, and it is certainly the CME cheese spot cheese price is used for that, but as we know, this price is also used by USDA as a component for pricing the class one and class two uh, milk. And there is no way, there, there is no price that you can look at as a direct market reference price for fluid milk. So this is, where, this is how the issue of price discovery or market transparency manifests itself in milk. So that's the subject of the panel. Uh, again, we will um, endeavor, and I do apologize. I know that people have submitted questions in response to uh, some of the questions or comments in the last panels. We haven't got to them. This is a one-hour panel. I'm going to talk as fast as I can and see if we can get to at least one question. And then after this panel, we will go into the public participation uh, session. But um, so let's, let's start at the beginning. Um, Tanya Rushing, uh, would you mind uh, telling us a little bit about uh, your dairy operation down there in Mississippi? and then tell us uh, what concerns you may have about how the current system works in terms of fluid milk prices. Certainly. We have approximately a 70 cow dairy. We milk twice a day. We have 200 acres of quality grassland. We've always been grass-based. We feed a little bit of feed in the barn for our cows, but overall, we're very reliant upon the fields and the hay that we produce off of those fields. Uh, we have two employees, and I was told earlier that uh, Vince, I didn't get to bring any of them with me. I have to mention them, and they 
if it weren't for good employees, we would not still be in existence. Um, they spoil our cows just like babies. And uh, so we're all one big happy family. Now, when it comes to the difference in price, I, when I started looking, trying to find the price of my milk at the milk plant, I had some issues. I did call, we have two milk plants in our area. I did call both of them. I identified myself as a producer that sent milk to their plant. They have lists of these people. They should know exactly who I am. The first plant, uh, basically three or four different people, told us that they were not allowed to give out that price that they pay per truckload of milk or per hundredweight. All of us dairy people uh, count everything in hundred pound terms. The second plant uh, gave us a real sweet runaround and sent us from one extension to another, to another department, to another extension, and finally we got an extension that didn't even exist. Now, lucky for us, we do know a few people in our co-op and we actually found out the price which it was for last month because they don't have this month's prices out yet another fallback to that discovery uh, current well currently I say which is May for us the price that my milk was paid at the bottling plant was twenty dollars and sixty five cents the price that I got on my check was fifteen dollars and sixteen cents that's $5.49 difference. Now, our pay price is contrived from the butter, powder, and block cheese markets on the Chicago Mercantile. Or on the Chicago Mercantile. And they also add in a Holland differential, and they also have a class one mover in there. My hauling cost is approximately $1 per hundredweight. And the way I see it, and the way a lot of my fellow local dairy farmers see it, is if we have to pay hauling costs for our milk to go from the farm to the plant, then any milk that's shipped in, which is called supplemental milk, to our area should have to do the same. And I'll talk a little more about that in just a few minutes. But that $5.49 that goes to pay for supplemental milk coming into our area because we are now a deficit area in the southeast. If even a little bit of that milk, uh, money could have gone back into dairy farmer pockets, and even as much as half, would have kept hundreds of farms in Mississippi from going out of business. It would also have helped out a whole lot uh, with problems that we've all faced since the tragedies of Hurricane Katrina. And I can firmly attest that there is still damage on my farm uh, from five years ago from that hurricane that I can't pay to fix. Now, from some of the other panels, I got curious and started figuring in between. That price that they paid to the bottling plant it's 1.36 times more than I get on my farm. If local milk by the gallon and all of us farmers look at it in the store, runs about $3.59 around our house, which figures out to be $40 to $1.80 per hundredweight. That is 2.76 times more than I get paid for my milk. So that's, that's a large difference. And that, like I said, was something that has kind of been brought up earlier today. Over the last 20 years that I've been involved in dairy, excessive milk production from larger and larger farms has created the world's lowest cost milk. There's been no market cultivated for this excessive milk production in surplus areas of the country because of current federal price supports, the guarantee of ways for it to go. The oversupply usually severely dispresses the price of butter powder and cheese on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. In 1990, when I entered the market, local producers in our area amounted for 85% of the Class I needs in the New Orleans market. Today, we only produce 35% of that market. The other 65% belongs to the 
belongs to supplemental milk, which I mentioned earlier. Most of this milk travels from over 900 miles away, crosses multiple state lines, and is placing a, just a tremendous burden on the local dairy farmers, as well as providing an extra carbon footprint on our nation's food supply, and that is also becoming an issue. But for every truckload of milk that enters the southeast, there are a few more dairy farmers that go out, and the ones that are left have to pay a larger amount of that hauling charge to get that milk brought into the southeast. If there are hauling charges, then uh, it probably wouldn't be so tough on us. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya. Um, I, th I think that gives a good uh, basis for us to now turn to uh, Bob Yonkers. Uh, Bob, as somebody who's studied uh, uh, these markets for decades uh, and, and now at the uh, International Dairy Foods Association, uh, can you put uh, Ms. Rushing's concerns into some context for us and can you explain a little bit more than I already did about what economists mean uh, when they talk about market transparency or price discovery? Oh, sure, Mark. In, in economic terms, the concept of price discovery requires both market participants, you usually think of those as buyers and sellers, and it also requires a marketplace. And for many commodities and products, that's an exchange of some kind. Uh, the CME group would be one that's been talked about. There's other exchanges where people can go to buy and sell. Not necessarily uh, spot markets or cash market prices, but also in the futures markets where, where much of that price is discovered for many agricultural commodities. Uh, just because, obviously when you have more buyers and sellers in a particular marketplace, you're going to have a more robust price discovery, more market activity leading to that price discovery. But it's not always an indication of how uh, the price discovery process is working because if there's only a few buyers or a few sellers of any particular commodity or product that you're looking at and they're all participating in the market, that's a very robust price discovery market and I'd like to talk more about that in a little bit. Um, and a lot of the attention in the dairy industry has been focused on the marketplaces or these exchanges where products are made. Uh, but one point I'd like to make is in the dairy industry, unlike most other agricultural commodities, we really don't have price discovery for farm milk. Uh, we have price discovery for cheddar cheese, we have price discovery for dry whey, we have some for butter and some for non-fat dry milk, and those are used in the federal milk marketing order and other state milk marketing orders that regulate prices for their price discovery and they take a weighted average of each of those individual markets. But when you start to segment those marketplaces, there's fewer buyers and sellers in each of those individual marketplaces than there would be in the marketplace for farm milk overall. And, and particularly at the CME Group spot market for cheddar cheese as an example, is there really aren't that many buyers on a regular basis that want to buy commodity spec cheddar from an unknown supplier. Most purchasers of, of cheese types today want it to certain specifications that may be a little different, usually more exacting than that that the CME specifications may have. Uh, and they want to know which supplier is supplying it, where it is in the country may make a difference also. It's very important and at the CME it could be sourced out of any, any region of the country. And in addition, there's not that many sellers because in today's marketplace, most of the sellers, the manufacturers of cheddar cheese, actually are producing for their regular customers. And because this market is not widely traded at the CME because there's just not that many buyers, there's not that many sellers that want to be producing more cheese than they need to serve their existing customer contracts and therefore have it available to bring. So it may be that all the buyers and sellers who could participate in that market are. Uh, I'll let others talk about whether that's true or not, but I mean, that's, that's the government regulations on milk prices are really driving us down to that. Now, related to price discovery is the need for transparency in, in having market information. And, and in dairy markets, we have price data from the CME 
you know, in virtually real time, anyone can access what's traded on the spot market as it's being traded. And in the futures contracts for dairy, uh, you can access those as they trade throughout the day because they do trade in a much longer period. In addition, USDA uh, collects and publishes data on dairy product prices uh, that are, represent transactions from across the country, not just those that are localized to the Chicago market area like the CME group uh, specifications require uh, that they be localized to that. Uh, and those are the products, again, cheese, dry whey, butter, and nuts. Some of on the panel will suggest that to improve price discovery, we need more data more frequently on those products in particular. Uh, but remember that milk prices, as they are set by the government, only change once a month, and we're already publishing that data weekly. Uh, I admit there is a time lag that I'd like to see reduced from USDA also with the NAS data collection. But uh, we only to really changing our regulated farm milk prices monthly. And again, if you were to think about trying to collect more data on other dairy products, we're going to run into the same problem with price discovery in that there's not that many buyers and sellers in those markets for those other dairy products either. We're getting farther and farther away from our more most robust numbers of buyers and sellers, which would really be in the market for farm milk, similar to the way they are for other commodities. Thank you, Bob. Before we move on, and I will move on next to uh, Andy Pauline from the Government Accountability Office, but I just want to ask if anybody else on the panel would like to uh, uh, comment or add to what Bob said about sort of classic uh, market transparency or price discovery or price transparency. All right, well then we'll move on. Uh, Andy Pauline. Uh, Andy, you studied uh, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, uh, the spot cheddar cheese market, uh, extensively in connection with a uh, 2007 report that the Government Accountability Office published. Uh, you know, what uh, did the GAO find regarding whether or not the concerns that uh, Ms. Rushing and uh, a lot of the farmers that we heard from this morning expressed uh, what did you find with regard to um, uh, whether those concerns are, are widely shared, and uh, what did you find with regard to regulatory and enforcement oversight of the CME dairy markets? Sure, thanks very much. Uh, you know, in 2007, we conducted a report where we were really looking at three issues. One was the structure and operations of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange spot cheese market, in particular as it compared to the kind of prior uh, incarnation of, of that cheese market at the National Cheese Exchange. Um, second was, as was mentioned, how the market was regulated and efforts to address potential manipulation. And third was how those CME spot cheese market prices impact milk pricing. Uh, the spot cheese market uh, at the CME uh, came there in 1997, and that was in the context of concerns about potential manipulation of prices at the prior market at the National Cheese Exchange. Um, Factors, you know, that are associated with the potential for price manipulation, a thin market, uh, you know, low trading volume, a small number of traders making the majority of trades existed at the National Cheese Exchange, and we found that they still exist at, at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange spot cheese market. Just to give a few numbers, uh, and, and Robert was making some reference to just how small the, the, the sort of trading volume is. Between 1997 and 2006, there were less than three trades per day uh, of the barrel cheese market. Uh, and between 1997 and 2007, um, in terms of sort of majority of buyers, there were two buyers that represented 74% of the purchases on the market in that, sim that same time frame. I think generally it's agreed and, and not particularly argued as, as a point that it is a thin market. In terms of, you know, sort of the extent of concerns about potential manipulation, we really heard about a variety of views on that. Uh, you know, certainly there were the fair share of, of folks who, who believe that there is potential manipulation occurring there. Uh, we also spoke to a number of industry participants who, who were not really particularly concerned about manipulation on the market. Uh, they said that they, uh, you know, sort of have faith in that market. They, they use the CME spot cheese prices in setting their prices. Um, they, they've never stopped using those prices out of any concern about manipulation. So there was really a wide variety of views on that. 
Um, as has been mentioned, you know, the minimum prices for raw milk bought by cheese manufacturers are set using a USDA pricing formula. The most significant component in that formula is the weekly average of cheddar cheese prices. Uh, at the uh, University of Wisconsin, they conducted a study uh, where they showed that between 2000 and 2007, uh, upwards of 83% of the USDA price of class three milk was coming from that cheese component. We found that the CME spot cheese market prices, as I mentioned, they're used by the dairy industry in establishing their prices to set contracts between market participants. Uh, there is, you know, as many of you know, the, the NAS survey of cheese prices. Uh, generally, what we found is that uh, although that survey was created specifically in the context of attempting to address concerns about potential manipulation at the spot cheese market, there really isn't much of a difference between the NAS survey of, of, of cheese price and the CME spot cheese price. Also, a University of Wisconsin study, uh, they found that there was a 98% correlation between NAS cheese prices and CME spot cheese prices. The USDA itself conducted an analysis in which they used NAS, uh, they used, excuse me, CME spot cheese prices instead of NAS survey prices, going back historically into the class three milk pricing, and they found that there was, again, a very small difference. They called it a difference of little significance. Um, this was all leading us to conclude that there is not a big difference between these prices, the CME spot cheese price and the NAS survey price, uh, and that USDA should give some consideration to alternative proposals uh, including using CME prices directly, uh, just understanding that there's not a big, big difference between those two things. Uh, as has been mentioned, future contracts for milk pricing are used in man that are used in manufacturing cheese are settled uh, at expiration using that same minimum price for milk price. Um, at the time of our report in 2007, CFTC had received several complaints of allegation or allegations from industry participants about potential price manipulation on the market, and in the context of our looking at the oversight of the market, we found that CFTC and the Mercantile Exchange itself were providing oversight of the market and that it was a substantial and significant increase of oversight as it related to the oversight that occurred at the National Cheese Exchange. CFTC, and I imagine Stephen will be talking about this in a moment, uh, they're interested in the spot cheese market in the context of how those CME spot cheese prices could impact prices in the related futures market. Uh, specifically, I'm just going to sort of share a few findings about what the CFTC oversight and the, the mercantile exchange itself, what their oversight consists of as it relates to this market. It was interesting in conducting this work, it just seemed as though a lot of folks didn't really appreciate or, or sort of fully understand the extent to which there is oversight of this market, independent of whether or not uh, manipulation is occurring, just that there is a, a fair amount of oversight that, that's ongoing. Uh, at CFTC specifically, uh, we found that uh, as of 2007, they had prepared summary documents analyzing the spot cheese market four times, including analysis of participants, volume, price fluctuations. Since 1999, CFTC had done nine special reviews of trading activity at the market in response to specific complaints. Uh, none of those reviews resulted in any legal action taken against a market participant. Um, I think most people are familiar with the DFA case. I'll, I'll just leave that for Stephen to address, but uh, clearly CFTC is, is engaged in, in overseeing this market. Um, from the CME oversight perspective, they're doing, conducting daily oversight of the market through their market regulation division. They have enforcement rules that prohibit price manipulation. Uh, they have a market analyst who daily is monitoring trading, uh, maintaining familiarity with industry trends, reviewing large price changes. And they have market regulation staff uh, who are reviewing traders' positions on the spot cheese market as well as the relationship to the class three futures market to determine if a, a, future, a trader's future position would benefit from price changes on the spot cheese market. Uh, just in conclusion, uh, broadly, we found that while not guaranteeing, of course, that price manipulation would be detected or prevented in terms of the extent of oversight that is there, that regular and targeted reviews of this market may help to ensure the integrity and confidence in the market. Uh, we had two recommendations in this report. One, as, as I believe I mentioned earlier, was for USDA to seriously consider 
alternatives to the NAS survey as a component into the milk pricing formula, including CME, given that there's not much difference there. Uh, we also had a concern that at that time, the NAS survey of cheese prices was not being audited. Um, it's my understanding that the USDA has now implemented an auditing program uh, and, and that that is underway. Um, and th those are the comments. Right. Well, I have, um, I'm trying to understand this myself. And um, so I've seen this uh, stated repeatedly about the correlation and then the CME price. And um, I'm trying to figure out what the significance of that is. And what I've, what I've been able to come up with is that it just shows that the CME price is used uh, in pricing uh, uh, transactions involving involving cheese, uh, and it shows that it is, it highly influences uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the market. Uh, but I guess what I'm struck with looking at all these other markets is that you need a price. You know, it, uh, in order to have a functioning market, you need some sort of price, a reference price. And there have been a, a lot of questions about whether this CME price is in fact uh, a good reflection of supply and demand, or other things that Bob talked about, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, whether it could can do the job as a price, and uh, maybe we'll get to that later. But uh, is that right about why that correlation is significant? It shows that people are in fact using the CME price. It was certainly the case that very consistently we heard from industry participants that they do in fact use the CME price. Uh, the, the difference between CME price and NAS survey of cheese prices, as, as we were told, is largely due to um, sort of discounts or premiums that might be attached to that CME price in the context of individual contracts. Uh, there is also a, a, a time lag issue, so the, the NAS survey of cheese prices can be sort of one to two weeks behind the pricing of the CME spot cheese market, but without question, uh, the industry you know, folks that we spoke to were using the CME price to, to establish their contract prices in the market. Right. So let me reiterate, uh, I think perhaps it's late enough in the afternoon that uh, we've lost our uh, 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 FFA volunteers. So if people do have questions or comments, you can just bring them up directly to Patrick here and we'll try to work them in. Um, but let's move now to, uh, to Steve Obi. Uh, and uh, Steve, um, as the acting director of the of enforcement uh, at the CFTC, what is the CFTC doing to ensure that the dairy markets are free of manipulation? Well, thank you very much, Mark, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I think um, you've been an incredible audience. You've been very patient, and I appreciate that. And I think one of the things to take away is that federal agencies are cooperating like never before. I mean, the partnership between USDA and DOJ and involving the CFTC in this discussion is very important because we all have a, a, a unique um, introspective into this marketplace. We conduct very vigorous surveillance of the dairy markets. Um, the CFTC has a very active surveillance program. You heard um, Andy talk about it. Um, we routinely get information in the spot market. An interesting thing that's, uh, that occurs with this marketplace is that the commission is in charge of regulating the futures markets. The spot market is something that I have enforcement authority over if there's a manipulation. And I think folks could see that we've been taking um, allegations of misconduct very seriously. We have um, obviously the DFA case that came out. Um, we have any number of active investigations in these marketplaces. You heard from prior panels, though, that the law is very difficult in this area in order to bring a case. And so um, while we as an enforcement arm of the CFTC can um, investigate and um, make cases, um, any problems in pricing really are going to come about through a partnership involving um, USDA, DOJ, and coming up with um, uh, different pricing measures or um, improvements into the marketplace. I do want to add a, a, a couple things, though. Um, one of the important parts that enforcement can play here, particularly with CFTC, is to have a regular dialogue 
with market participants so that when you see areas of concern, when you see prices that are abnormal, I'd be very grateful if people would give us a call. We have a toll-free number. We have investigators that will um, take your information, and it will enable us to um, continue to vigorously police these markets. Our number is 866-FON-CFTC. Um, and we rely to a great extent on leads from local communities because you have your ears to the ground. Um, and, and your leads are um, enable us to be the cop on the beat. The, the other point that I think is, um, is um, interesting to note here is that um, people are really itching for price discovery and real-time information. And I note that the CME uh, just started a uh, cheese futures contract that is starting, uh, just started trading on Tuesday. And maybe that will be able to add additional information into the marketplace. Obviously, we try to be as vigorous as possible with surveillance, but even if there's a perception that a marketplace is not functioning properly, we want to be um, alerted to that because perceptions themselves um, can really undermine the confidence that is needed by you, the farmers, and the public um, in the marketplaces that we oversee. Um, this is not a, a, a marketplace um, that is actively traded. We've heard that it's a thinly traded market. And from an enforcement perspective, um, that concerns me because it means that um, it will only take a little bit of nefarious activity to resources into our investigations in order to um, determine whether that nefarious conduct has occurred. Well, let me, let me ask you this. Uh, is there a distinction between the uh, intensity of the regulation or oversight that you do with future markets and what you can do with the spot cheese market? Yes, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, in the futures markets, we have very, very strict regulations about the design of contracts. Um, one of the factors is that they cannot be susceptible to price manipulation. So there are core principles that apply to futures contracts. The commission does not oversee uh, the trading in the spot marketplace. The enforcement arm, when we get leads, will investigate it because obviously the spot marketplace greatly affects the futures prices. Um, and so that's how we get involved from an enforcement perspective. Um, and, and, you know, one of the great things about this partnership now between USDA, CFTC, and DOJ is that we're getting a much greater understanding of, of the problems in the area and the weaknesses um, where nefarious conduct can occur. Um, last, I guess this morning, um, the conference in, um, in the House and the Senate um, came to an agreement for financial reform. And that bill, which um, still now needs to go back to the House and then to the Senate, but it looks like um, that bill will be um, passing very shortly, will provide additional enforcement powers for the CFTC um, and provide extensive rulemaking powers for the CFTC so that um, additional um, um, oversight and additional um, um, efforts can be utilized to ensure that uh, the marketplace is free of manipulation and responding properly. Thank you very much. We're going to talk uh, in a minute about enhanced reporting, which is uh, what Denny Wolf uh, is going to talk about, and alternatives uh, altogether, uh, uh, competitive pay, pay price uh, alternative to the use of a measure or an indicator like the uh, CME spot cheese price when uh, Dan Smith talks. But let me pause for a minute and just say, uh, does anybody want to comment uh, or uh, elaborate on anything that we've talked about so far? Okay. Um, so uh, to Dennis Wolf, uh, Denny, uh, you've thought a lot about price discovery and market transparency, both as the uh, former agriculture commissioner in Pennsylvania and in connection with the work that you're doing with the Dairy Policy Action Coalition. Uh, should be done in market transparency. Well, Mark, I've thought of it uh, for a longer period of time than when I was secretary or now representing DPAC because uh, my entire adult life I was a dairy farmer, and uh, I still am. But uh, it doesn't, uh, it didn't matter during the last uh, six or seven years with the many roundtable dairy discussions uh, that we held in Pennsylvania, 
uh, whether it was uh, when I was at the department or whether it was through the DPAC organization, it represents several thousand dairy producers today. Transparency and price discovery easily floated to the top every time we were talking about how we'd, we may be able to reform federal dairy policy and federal dairy pricing. And we really think it's the cornerstone of any changes that happen going forward in uh, federal policy reform. And we think that you need to do that uh, by diluting the influence of the CME. I mean, we need the CME. Uh, that's a given uh, you know, with the futures market uh, and also having a place to go and market product. But we think for the small volume of product that ex is exchanged on the CME, uh, it has way too much impact. And when you look at four-tenths of one percent of the cheese processed in the United States being marketed on the CME or less than two percent of the butter, having the trillion dollar industry, and that's at farm gate on milk prices, uh, that is concerning. We do not think that it necessarily reflects current market conditions, and we do not think that it necessarily accurately reflects supply demand. We think it is uh, often used as a market of last resort, and of course, as mentioned, a very small amount of product trading there. We think that uh, in diluting this, uh, there's uh, one specific way that you can do that, and that's electronic daily reporting. Congress recognized this when they were writing the last Farm Bill, and they wrote a section in 1510 that says uh, electronic reporting on a more frequent basis shall be implemented by the Secretary of Agriculture with uh, the keyword pending funding. So uh, we've been working on that in terms of uh, trying to uh, move that forward. Uh, we have uh, uh, circulated letters in both the House and the Senate and sent them to Senator Cole and Congresswoman DeLauro. Uh, they chair the uh, House and the uh, Senate Ag Appropriations Committee to uh, see that that funding is included uh, in the next appropriations bill for 2011. <clears throat> so, you know, why do you need that? And I think, you know, the, the NAS survey is important information and it's good information. But if you take and, and use a real-life example, if yesterday, which was June 24th, and I was going to uh, uh, negotiate a price for, say I'm a cheese manufacturer and I'm going to sell 100 uh, barrels of cheddar to a customer, uh, the information I have is the CME or NAS survey. If you look at NAS survey, the information for NAS survey that I would have had available yesterday, June 24th, would have been from June 7th to the 11th, starting back 17 days ago. So how do you get what the current market of a product is with that kind of lag? Electronic reporting on a daily basis takes that away. It much aligns with, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the pork industry, the beef industry have daily electronic reporting and sometimes more than, than once a day. So that is uh, <clears throat> very important uh, in terms of, of making sure that we have uh, accurate reporting uh, timely reporting every day, <clears throat> and then to build from that, include more products, include all manufactured products, not just the four products that are currently uh, used in the NAS survey. So I think when you get that, you, st you certainly start to get uh, much closer to uh, having better price discovery, and that's what our dairy farmers want. Uh, they uh, do not trust the way that it is currently uh, being handled, uh, and that is goes mainly to how thinly it's traded, and as was mentioned earlier, if uh, two buyers have been responsible for buying 74% of the products over the last 10 years, you just hope they haven't had coffee together that morning uh, when they go in and make their decisions on what they're buying and what they're paying. I'd just like to read one statement here uh, and then make a few comments on it. The statement goes like this. This reform brings 100% transparency to the market with real-time reporting. Uh, there will no longer they will no longer be able to make excessive profits by operating in the dark. Exposing these markets to the light of day will put the money where it belongs. Now, I'm not talking about the CME. I'm talking about the first bullet point uh, that was written on a section-by-section -section analysis of House Resolution 4173 that passed out a conference committee uh, late last night, which is, is better known as Restoring America's Financial Stability Act and it's basically reforming Wall Street and the banking industry as it correlates uh, to the derivatives market. So that is, uh, that is a fundamental rule. You know, 
that's just not a rule we're talking about here in the dairy industry that the dairy farmers are concerned about today. It's a fundamental rule in price discovery, and it's a fundamental rule in transparency. Thank you very much, Denny. Uh, all right, so now, and now for something completely different. Uh, we've asked Dan Smith to join us on this panel. Uh, Dan uh, is here on uh, uh, subbing at the last minute, and I'm very grateful to him for uh, our panelists that was going to be on this panel, Paul Christ, who uh, had a death in the family this week, and our condolences go out to Paul and his family. Uh, but Dan, you and Paul have been uh, working uh, with the Maine Dairy Association on a proposal that, among other things, provides for direct price discovery of dairy prices based on actual market transactions in certain geographic areas. Um, I do not know because I forgot to check, but I think that we uh, at least had every intention of taking some charts and maps that uh, um, uh, uh, Paul, uh, Paul Christ and, and Dan Smith have uh, developed that, um, and copying them and putting them out on the, uh, uh, the tables outside. But um, if we haven't done it by now, we'll certainly make them uh, available. Uh, and you can go to the USDA Dairy Industry Advisory Committee website and find uh, the entire presentation that, uh, uh, that Dan and Paul did that has these maps. But with that preface, let me ask you, uh, Dan, if you would describe your ideas uh, about how to arrive at a price uh, that can be used for market transparency and price discovery in, uh, in milk. And maybe uh, since people might be fam familiar with the old uh, MW price, the old Minnesota-Wisconsin price, maybe you could kind of compare it a little bit to that. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I, I to reiterate what you said, um, our thoughts are with, with Paul's family. It's been a, a real privilege. I think many people in the room are likely familiar with Paul, um, working as long as he did with Land of Lakes. Um, Paul is really the mechanic of our proposal, and I'm, I'm sort of the, the broader architect of it, so you'll get a little bit of the context of where it came from from me. And I, if, if it's you'd like, we can have Paul submit something for the record in terms of, of more of the details of the, of the mechanics. As Mark said, um, Paul and I made a, propo a uh, presentation to Secretary Vilsack's Dairy Advisory Committee a couple weeks ago, and, and uh, you can find more information there. The proposal also has been through one round of, of a AMS hearing, and that's available on, on their website, Paul's testimony and, and cross, um, including, uh, did Bob, did you cross Paul, or I can't remember, if, I guess you're the attorney for IDFA cross Paul, but, but in any event, the, the proposal has been through uh, one round of hearing process, so there is a fair amount of information available at, uh, at this point. Um, just back up where we, where we started from, um, really the, the uh, uh, essential premise stems from Sec uh, Senator Feingold's uh, comments this morning about trying to find something up, around which the industry might be able to find consensus. Um, my work with, with the fluid milk market and class one prices and the value in the class one uh, price is truly proves, does prove to be quite divisive. Um, this work is, has been quite different. There's, there is a, a general consensus throughout the industry that end product pricing, which is used for both class three and four pricing, is not working. Um, not only not working as it was intended with 2000 order reform, but just plain not working and needs to be replaced. Um, there, I, in, in all the years I've been doing this, I've never seen such consensus not only uh, within different groups in the industry, but across groups in the industry. Producers and processors both in general concurrence that end product pricing is not working. And, and the, the uh, uh, common refrain is twofold. One, what, what has been repeated all day is the CME is, is uh, too thin a market to, to base a, a, a pricing proposal around. And the second is that um, where the, the uh, to, to start with you, um, where the, the farmer sells his or her milk to a processor, that's what should be priced, not what happens to the milk once the processor <coughs> takes possession of the milk, turns it into cheese or butter or whatever the processor turns it into. 
as, as uh, Bob said, that's, that's not a price discovery mechanism for milk. So um, I, doing some initial research into how end product pricing uh, emerged uh, out of the 2000 order reform, I discovered that uh, consensus of opinion right at the outset, that if there was an ability to come up with a proposal that would price the transaction between the producer and the processor, rather than the, product, the processor and his or her customer downstream, that that would be a, a proposal for uh, price discovery that the industry might embrace with some consensus. So um, at that point, uh, I, I hooked up with Paul because Paul had been working on, on an alternative, uh, which he dubbed a competitive pay price um, for a number of years. And we, we framed a proposal and submitted it to uh, USDA um, and uh, went to hearing on the proposal in 2007. Um, the, just back up one, one step further, um, in terms of the, the other uh, important participant in this process is the Maine Dairy Industry Association, which is really the, the sponsor of this that, that uh, Paul and I went to hearing on behalf. And this ties into Mark's question about the MW. As, as I get along, I find virtually no advantages to getting older. Um, other, other than uh, the, the some experience and hopefully wisdom. I think at my age, wisdom is still, I'm, I'm too not only humble to think that I'm accruing any wisdom, but I haven't seen it yet. So hopefully that comes. But the experience is definitely there. And, and one of the advantages also of the aging of the dairy industry is there are, you work with people who have a lot of experience and wisdom. So the Maine Dairy Industry Re Association Board represents both of those. And the constant refrain about this new end product pricing proposal, uh, uh, pricing uh, formula being uh, non-transparent, we batted that around in, in the boardroom before we, we developed our proposal. And there was a, an understanding among the, the uh, dairy men, mostly dairy men in the room, that 25 and 40 years ago leading to 2000, from 1960 to 2000, with pricing off the, off the MW, you had a, a manufactured price that tracked off of the surplus price for grade V milk, plus a class one differential, blended against the utilization was the farmer's pay price. And that was in, in, in for the farm community itself transparent. So there, the, all of this opaqueness that's involved with end product downstream product pricing wasn't even in view uh, for in, uh, the, the basic understanding that all these guys had grown up with. They knew what their milk price was. They may not have liked their milk price, but they knew what their milk price was and where it came from. So that was built in as really a, a, a fundamental point that if we could get back to pricing the transaction between the farmer and the processor, in addition to focusing on what ought to be focused on, just from a sort of common sense standpoint, that ought to lend further transparency to, to the pricing structure because when Denny sells his milk to his processor, that's what ought to be priced. So those were the, the, the two um, uh, original starting points. Then when I dug into it a little bit more and thought about it a little bit more, we batted around a little bit more, come to find out that the volatility in the marketplace that we deal with, everybody deals with uh, in, in the marketplace, in, the, in, in a fluid organized market, because the class one mover tracks off the manufacturer price, um, that the, the volatility that emerges in the class one, which is moved anywhere from $11, $9 at the bottom to upwards of 25, I'm, I'm, I'm mixing, from $13 on the class one price to $25 on the class one price, it's moved $12, and it moved $9, $9 in about nine months. That volatility on the fluid market, which generates all the discussion of where is that money going, at bottom it's tied to the, to the class one mover. So the volatility in the market can on some level also be attributed to that, that manufactured price. So if we can deal with consensus uh, and product price and whether there's something that could be done differently. So that, that's really where we started with. Um, we. Uh, uh, developed uh, a, a body of, of data that was really organized around the Midwest because there's clearly competition for milk in, in the manufactured uh, market here. 
uh, the question was whether that was enough milk. And that's really where the proposal foundered at, at the hearing, that it was too limited a volume of milk. USDA quite understandably said, based on that limited volume of milk, it's not really representative enough to build a, a proposal around. But given the industry's uh, uh, embracing of the idea at the hearing, despite asking a lot of questions, um, Paul and I and, and MDIA decided to go forward with, with, the, with the proposal. So we're now basically four years into a fairly extensive discussion around the industry and with USDA about the, the proposal. As Mark indicated, um, there are a series of maps that we actually didn't put together. USDA put together um, through a, a fairly extensive uh, analysis of, of, of uh, milk across the federal order system to answer the question as to whether there is sufficient milk in the system that is being competitively traded that might be used as the basis for the proposal. Um, as uh, Brian in the previous panel talked about, we, we use the HH, the Herfindahl Index, which measures competition uh, in the industry. We went looking for areas of the country where competition exists, um, both using that index and using uh, a, a threshold of, of five or six processors bidding for milk, um, and asked USDA to analyze uh, the volume of milk and its distribution geographically, its disaggregation. Um, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, amount of milk and, and its distribution. Um, the, uh, what came back was a surprise to Paul that there was more milk than he thought there would be, measured um, against the threshold of numbers of processors, roughly 60% of the milk in, in the country, at least by that measure, is, is uh, uh, competed for, um, measured against the Herfindahl Index, which, which roughly represents what, what uh, the Department of Justice looks into, uses as its benchmark for whether uh, there are competitive problems, that number dropped to 50 percent. So um, at, at our second look, roughly half the milk in the country is available to be used as the basis for framing um, a, a, a replacement model for, for end product pricing. So we're, we're now, based on the, that available data, um, we're developing uh, further developing our proposal, it would work somewhat like this. We would look for representative zones um, um, w uh, across that 50 percent of the milk where the, the transaction between the processor and the farmer in those zones could be deregulated, removed from the federal order, minimum pricing regimen, and just uh, based on that competitive okay. that's what you're getting. Um, uh, th though instead of a NAS survey, it would just be a reporting of, of that pricing um, across those competitive zones, and, okay. and that's, that's the proposal. And I, uh, again, I will uh, uh, commend uh, the uh, full presentation of this uh, to uh, interested members of our audience. Uh, we want to go ahead and, and move on to uh, the uh, last public participation phase at the no workshop and try to stay a little bit near uh, on time. Uh, and we are joined again, as he uh, had promised earlier, by uh, Senator Feingold for, for this part of the, the session. So uh, you should have told me that yeah. sooner. So, uh, <laughs> uh, like right you're, you're very far down there, so I couldn't signal too much. <laughs> but uh, thank, thanks to the members of this panel. And uh, will my colleague Josh Sovin and John Farrell will as well as the senator will uh, now take your comments. If you uh, have red tickets and would like to line up again, uh, we'll move to that phase of the workshop. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.